Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to have you here with us this evening uh, for midweek with uh, Double Creek time uh, on this Thursday night at 7, 7.30. Uh, you know, we look forward to this time each week. It's just a chance that we have where we can be able to uh, hopefully get some encouraging words, but also a chance for us just to be in God's Word and, um, and to still be able to to fellowship together in this capacity in this way so so we look forward to this time it's just a quick time uh no no more than 30 minutes max counting prayer and everything so um just a quick time for us to be together if you are catching us live uh we're glad to have you here if you catch us later on uh, on our facebook page or while this is on our website under the sermons and videos tabs um you know hopefully you get some encouraging words out of this so i want to go ahead and get us started here this evening um and I want to start us off with a word of prayer. And, and I want to mention real quickly that uh, we have somebody at our church, uh, a young lady. Uh, her name is Leanne Brannick. She's the daughter of Julie and Tony. And, and tomorrow she's going to have a, some tests, a procedure done. I guess a procedure done at a Baptist hospital in heart, a heart ablation. I guess I said that right. Uh, and it's at Baptist tomorrow. And if all goes well, she, she should be home Friday evening. So... Uh, Let's remember Leanne and their family uh, in your prayers. Uh, I'm sure she's got a lot of nervousness going on. And so, hey, uh, hopefully what we have to say today will, will touch your heart, Leanne. And uh, let us know that we love you guys. Uh, and I know our church family will be praying for you. And, and those outside of our church family, our extended family as well, will be praying for you. So, uh, so let's go ahead and open this with a word of prayer for tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, God, and we thank you for your many blessings, Father. We just thank you for your love, Father, for your peace, Father, the peace that you give us that surpasses all understanding. And it is a peace that we can't understand sometimes and that we, we don't know how we get it sometimes and where it comes. We know where it comes from, Father, but uh, just, Father, it's, it's more. You give us so much more and so many blessings that, uh, that uh, we take for granted. God, I pray that you watch especially over Leanne and the family tomorrow and the doctors and, and with her procedure, Father, that everything goes smoothly, Father, and that they can get to the, to the, to the heart of the issues, Father, and just, uh, Father, that she can uh, be back to normal and just that things will uh, be straightened out, Father. We pray that you would just be with her nerves, uh, give her some, put, uh, some peace, Father, and just, uh, Father, the courage to go through this, Father, and to know that, uh, that you are there and that we're all praying for her, Father, and that... Uh, and that uh, we love her and we love the family and we just pray that you would just be with them tomorrow and the, the doctors and the hands that are, are going to be doing everything. Father, we pray that you watch over our time here this evening as we go through this, that it'll be a time that honors and glorifies you. Uh, Father, we love you and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So if you've been with us on any of our other past weeks, you know that we're doing a journey through through Joshua right here and, and we're going to be in Joshua chapter 3 today and we're going to be looking how it was time to move for these for these Israelites um, they came to a time where and this is not moving with me right now for some reason mm -hmm. did it finally move all right and so we're we're looking today at Joshua chapter 3 and it was time to move finally for these for these Israelites the time's finally here. After all these years, you know, it had been centuries since God had already promised to Abraham that the Israelites would get this land of Canaan that was promised to them. And then after they were slaves in Egypt for, for 400 years, and, and they come out of, the, out of Egypt and, and get ready to go to the land of Canaan, uh, they had to wait 40 more years. But God is finally at this point ready again to move His chosen people the Israelites, across this river, the Jordan River, into the land of Canaan, the land that he had promised to Abraham and his descendants hundreds of years before. So I want us to think about a couple of things before we get into this. You know, have you ever been in a position to where uh, you were about to move into a new position or a location? Maybe it's a new job, maybe you, your first job, but you're starting something new. Or whether you're moving out of your parents' home and, and going to college, whether it's recently or you're about to, or whether you did it 50 years ago or 20 years ago. You know, just moving like that, making that decision. Maybe when you hear this, you start thinking about uh, it brings to mind a decision you made to get married and how you realize that 
you would be leaving so much of what you've known your whole life behind. You know, whenever we make big moves like this, it brings emotions for some people. A lot of different emotions. For, for some of us, it may be that, that we're leaving a place that we love just to do something different, to start something different. Maybe we're looking forward to that move, but, but, but even if you're looking forward to it, it still is going to bring about some nervousness, some anticipation, some excitement, maybe even fatigue because it takes a lot to do some of these things. And for some of you, maybe uh, it's putting you in a place or moving to a place uh, away from negative feelings into something that is good. And for some of us, maybe it's the opposite. We've Things have been going great and something comes up and we have a lot of things going on in our lives that can bring us down. Whatever the situation is, when we make a move in some way, it'll bring a lot of the same feelings and emotions. Imagine with me here, if you will, uh, about a couple of different things. If you have ever left home to attend college and live in a college dorm, do you remember what that was like the very first time you did it? You know, for me, it was a time of uh, you're, you're nervous. Uh, you've got a little bit of fear. You, you've, you're an, you, you're, you anticipate what it's going to be like, and, and you may know who your roommate's going to be or not, but even if you do know your roommate, you typically, you're usually not, so, it's not someone you've lived with. So you never know for sure quite how that's going to play out. Or maybe you've entered, you, but you know for sure you're getting ready to enter into a new world, something that is different, something you're not familiar with. And, and not knowing how this is going to end sometimes uh, can bring feelings of excitement or nervousness or fatigue, anticipation, doubts, a lot of different things. Yet during this time, a time that you left to go to college or whatever, you know in your heart that it's time to move. You can think about something like that, or you can think about something like this. If, you, if you've ever gotten married, you know, it's a time of excitement when you're dating someone that you love. And, and when it's a time of excitement when you are the one either proposing or the one being proposed to. And then even after the proposal, hopefully she said yes, there's times of excitement. And, and that excitement doesn't end when you have a man or a woman that loves each other. And, you, and they enjoy being with each other. That excitement doesn't end for those two. And so, whether that's your case or not, you're going on to do something new. If you've ever started a new job or done anything like that, yet even during these times, you know in your heart that it's time to move. Now, those types of moves for us seem like big deals. They seem huge, and in many ways they are for us. But those, the way those feelings are for us then would be nothing probably compared to what the Israelites would be feeling here in Joshua chapter 3. Now if you remember from our time together last week, we talked about Rahab in chapter 2 and how, how she hid the two spies that came from the Israelites into, into Jericho to spy out the city. And we talked about how she was someone who was a harlot. She, had a, she went from being wrecked to rescued. She had a wrecked past. She was a harlot. She was a prostitute. She was a Canaanite woman. She was wrecked, and she, and she, was a, and she became rescued after she put her faith in this God of the Israelites. And so the spies go and see her, and she, she rescues them. And, and when they come back to the Israelites, in the last verse of Joshua chapter 2, we read these words. They said to Joshua, Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before us. You see, based on what they were told by Rahab, these two spies knew that the people of Jericho were terrified. They were frightened of these Israelites because they had already heard all the stories about what God was doing for them. They had heard about the plagues in Egypt. They had heard about how God had opened up the Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground. How He provided for them now for 40 years out there in this desert, in this wilderness. They understood all this stuff. And so they came back with more news. They came back with news that was confirming that the time was now. The time to move was right now. They came back confirming this news. God had already told Joshua way back in chapter 1 that I'm going to give this land to you. 
They come back confirming the time was now. No more waiting. And so the third chapter opens up this way. In Joshua chapter 3 and verse 1 it says this. It says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out from Shittim and came to the Jordan. And they lodged there before they crossed. Now this is a time of excitement for them. If you remember, 40 years now had passed before the Israelites were already at this point. They were at this point before 40 years ago. See, 40 years ago, had 40 years had passed since those 12 spies that we read about in Numbers 13 and 14. 40 years had passed since those 12 spies were sent to spy out the land of Canaan. And out of those 12 spies, only two of them, Joshua and Caleb, came back trusting in God to hand over these powerful cities across this Jordan River to the Israelites. The other 10 spies that went, they came back and they said, yes, the land's great. It's flowing with milk and honey. A lot of great things there, but the people are powerful. The people are strong. We shouldn't go take over this land. And so these other 10 spies, they had all of these Israelites here in an uproar. They were complaining. And because they didn't believe, because they rebelled against God, they weren't allowed to cross the river. They didn't think that they should. And so God says that they're not going to be able to. You see, in a way, they were right. Because they couldn't defeat those people across the, across the river. But God could. And they didn't trust in God's power. Even though they had seen his power in Egypt with the plagues and the Red Sea and, and how he had miraculously provided for them, even though they had seen these things, they rebelled against God. And since they rebelled against God, in Numbers chapter 14, this is what we read. Uh, verses 28 through 30, it says, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in the wilderness. Even all your numbered men, according to your complete number, from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. And so this kind of brings us back up to our point here in Joshua chapter 3. Out of all those people 40 years ago that God was going to first put into the land, only Caleb and Joshua would be the ones who would be allowed to enter. See, they had spied out the land for 40 days back there. Those 12 spies did. And since they rebelled against God for each day that they had spied out the land, now they were to bear the guilt for a year for each day. So for 40 years now, they've been in the desert, in the wilderness, just God providing for them. And then once this generation has died, God would now let the Israelites take this land that had been promised them. And so that's where we're at in Joshua chapter 3. And we see that the time was now for them to do what they had waited now 40 years since leaving, leaving Egypt. They had set out to go over the Jordan River here in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 1. They had set out to come to the Jordan River and to cross over. And this walk and this journey that they were doing that we read about in Joshua 3, 1 to the Jordan River was only a few miles. It was pretty smooth ground. Uh, it wasn't tough terrain, so it wouldn't have been a terrible journey for them. But can you imagine the excitement that would have been going on? The things that would have been said. I bet there was a big buzz among all the tribes. I bet in each tribe there was a lot of talking about what they were finally getting ready to do. They knew the history. They knew about the promise. And now they're finally getting to do it. They're the ones that get to make it happen. They were surely excited, but I'm sure there was some nervousness. And I would imagine that some of them were even talking to each other and saying, this is the day. This is the time. Our dreams are finally coming true. We're coming to the place where our forefathers blew it 40 years ago, but we will obey. Have you ever felt that way? Whether you're going to college, whether you're starting a new job, whether you're starting a marriage or starting something else new, whatever it is, you're excited, you're nervous, and that day is finally here. Maybe it's going for a trip. You look forward to it for so long, the day is finally here. But, you know, maybe it's getting married, you're excited, you're nervous, whatever it is, the day is finally here. 
And so for these Israelites, the time was now. It was time to move. But what happens when it doesn't seem ideal? What happens when these Israelites who had waited 40 years finally get to the Jordan River? Well, they just lodged there. They didn't cross that day. But you know what they saw when they got to the Jordan River? They saw the Jordan River. And maybe for some of them it was the very first time. I don't know. But I know when they got there, they saw that this is no little stream that we're going to be crossing over. This was the Jordan River that they were seeing. And not only that, it was the mighty Jordan River at its mightiest during harvest season right now. Which meant, being harvest season, that the Jordan River was deeper and wider than at any other time of the year. See, at this time, the Jordan River would have been about a mile wide. It would have been deeper than at other times throughout the year. And in the 15th verse of Joshua chapter 3, it ends this way. It says, For the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of the harvest. See, this was the worst possible time to cross. And I think God puts people in situations like this occasionally that are the most difficult, that seem like they're not ideal, so that we can't do it on our own, so that we have to rely on Him. And so I wonder if some of these people maybe had a little bit of doubt or fear when they saw this. Because this certainly was not the ideal time for crossing this river. Not without a bridge, not without a boat or some type of ship to get across. But the time was now. It was time to move, even though it didn't seem ideal. You see, these Israelites, some two million or so people at this time, were now lodging next to this flowing river. And they're hearing the waters every minute of the day. Maybe they lay down to go to sleep at night and they hear the sound of rushing waters close by and they know deep down that somehow, some way, and someday soon, they're going to cross over that. To so think about their excitement. And maybe some of these Israelites even wandered up to take a look at this river and saw the strength of it. Maybe some of them saw it and thought, there's no way we can cross all of that. Not all of us. Because we have women, we have children, we have babies, we have livestock, we have possessions, we have some people who are just too weak to cross that. See, I don't know how they all felt at first, but if some of them ever felt that way, remember this. When it seems there is no way, God creates a highway. And if you've ever felt that way, in a position where you feel like you're stuck and maybe it's not going to work out, remember this. When it seems like there is no way, God creates a highway. It may not always come in the way or even the time that we would like or expect, but God creates the way for us to get through each situation that we face in life. Even when it doesn't seem like an ideal situation or the ideal time. So throw your doubts, your fears, anxiety, worry, depression, whatever out the window and put your trust in God. Put your trust in Jesus. After all, it was Jesus who said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we have to stop putting our trust in all of these other things around us, like governments, like jobs, like an ever-changing economy, and so many other things, and we have to start putting our trust in Jesus even when it doesn't seem ideal. Because even when it doesn't seem ideal, God shows up. See, the Israelites come to this river. They lodge there for three days. And so what now? What do we do? At the end of these three days, Joshua tells them what they're going to do. He tells the priest, he tells everyone, really, the priests are going to carry the Ark of the Covenant ahead of you. And you're going to cross this river on dry ground behind them. The Ark of the Covenant had three items in it that were special to, to God and special to the Israelites. The Ark of the Covenant had one that had some manna in it, which was the, the food that God used to provide for those Israelites while they were in this desert. It had Aaron's staff in it, and it had the two stone tablets that God's finger himself had written the Ten Commandments on within the Ark of the Covenant. But see, the Ark of the Covenant was the place where God dwelt. 
And so these priests take the Ark of the Covenant. And they're to go into this river and they're to step in. And when they do this, the waters of the Jordan would be cut off. And they would all be able to cross over on dry ground. So in a way, God's saying, when you follow this Ark of the Covenant that's carried by the priests, you're following me through there. In a way, he's saying, follow me and I'll get you through this. The same thing he says to us when we're in a tough situation. Follow me and I'll, and I'll get you through this. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will get you through it. Because when something doesn't seem ideal, God shows up when we put our trust in Him. God didn't send an army first. He didn't send Joshua first or one of the other leaders. He sent the ark. And the rest follow. And here's what we kind of have to remember with this. This was a large group of people. It was a large number. And I don't know about you. But, but as a kid, I kind of just always imagined this. Got a picture in my head of this crossing of the Jordan River in this way. That, that they went through in rows of ten or whatever. I'm sure it wouldn't have been too orderly. But in a small, tight group. And that the water was sitting there on both sides of them. But it doesn't appear to have happened that way. In Joshua chapter 3 and verse 16, it tells us this. The waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan. This city, Zarethan, was about 30 miles upriver. And see, God needed a wide path for all of these Israelites and what they had to be able to cross over on dry ground. And so that's what he does. And then the chapter closes by letting us know that the priest stood in the middle with the ark until on this dry ground until everyone crossed over on dry ground. And once again, God shows up. When things didn't seem ideal, God shows up and performs in a mighty way. When things didn't seem ideal, God shows up and delivers. When things were not ideal, God shows up and He took care of any doubts, worries, fears, or anxiety, or anything else that could have held the Israelites back. And you know what? When we have doubts, worries, fears, anxiety, depression, anger, whatever it is that is holding us back, God will show up and deliver. Sometimes it may not be as quick as we want it to, or it may not even be the way we want. Because God doesn't work on our time. And He doesn't work by our wants and our desires. God works by His timing and His ways. But when He works, He works in a way that can often leave us speechless. God will work in a way that will make us realize that we simply cannot do it on our own. We can't handle everything on our own. And so many times I think He puts us in situations that seem to be ideal so that we understand that we cannot do it on our own. When things don't seem ideal for us, God shows up. And so as we close here this evening, our time together with Midweek with Double Creek here on this Thursday evening, think about a time in your life where things were not ideal for you and everything worked out. Because God showed up. And if you can't remember a time like that, maybe we need to stop and think, am I trying to do too much on my own and leave God out? See, let's not wait until God is our last option to try to get through life's difficulties. Instead, let's make sure that God is our only option for getting through life's difficulties. And so as individuals... As a congregation, as the church, the body of Christ all over this world, let's start by right now understanding it's time to move. See, every day for the church is a time to work and a time to move. Every day is a time to move. Even when it doesn't seem ideal. For these Israelites, it may not have seemed ideal to some of them to cross the Jordan at the worst time of the year when it's the fullest why couldn't we do it when it was weaker? When it was, when it was uh, not as wide, when it wasn't as deep? Because when you cross something in that situation, 
God doesn't have to be involved. He doesn't have to show up. But when things are difficult, when things are not ideal, God will show up and leave people speechless. And so for you as well, when you have difficulties in life and you've got things that make you nervous and things that have you worried and things that have you concerned, that's when God shows up. Remember that as we go through each day of our lives. I want to thank you for being with us tonight for our time of Double Creek, Midweek with Double Creek. And this Sunday morning, we're going to conclude at, at, at Double Creek, we're going to conclude our uh, seven-week series, A Time for Jesus, by looking at the mind of Christ and kind of who He was in His mind before and as He came into earth, as He was here on this earth. And so uh, we're going to finish that up this Sunday. But remember what I said. It's a time to move people. It's, it's time to put our faith and trust in God. It's time to, when things aren't going our way and things are difficult, which things certainly are right now in our world, it's time to put our faith and trust in God. And God will show up. So let's close this with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings, God. We just thank you for the time. I thank you for the time that we've had here this evening, Father, to be together. Father, just to, to get into your word, just to look a little bit more at, at the journey through the book of Joshua, God. And, and we're going to see so often here in the next so many weeks how you show up when things don't seem ideal and how you take care of situations when things are not ideal. And, and Father, it's, we're going to see often that it's time to move. It was time to move for those Israelites. It's time for us to move as a church. Father, outside of our walls and to reach those in our communities and those in the world, Father, who are, who are lost, Father, and who are, who are hurting. So, God, we pray that you just lead us and guide us, God. I pray once again that you watch over uh, Leanne and her family and the doctors tomorrow, Father. I pray that uh, it'll be a time, Father, where once again you show up. Uh, that's what we're asking for, God, a time where you show up and you make things happen and you just leave people speechless. God, I pray that you would just lead us and guide us. Be, watch over us, keep us safe until the next time that we can be together, Father, whether it's in, whether it's in person or whether it's here uh, on live stream, Father. Just lead us and guide us. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.